Hi, Facebook friends. It's Donna Martini here, live at 7 whatever, 7.01. Sorry, I'm a minute late. I have a big topic to talk about tonight. It's a tough topic. It's actually been a tough week because I did engage in some conversation with a few people, and I was really shocked and thrown back by some of the attitudes that men had towards this topic and women in general. Um, but that, I guess I shouldn't be so shocked because there are men who are doing this kind of thing and some are in denial of, of what they say and do and that it is a, a negative effect. They think it's sarcasm. They think it's joking around. They don't realize um, what they're doing and the effect it has on women. So I thought I would just talk and I'm, I'm on here tonight. You know, I'm a wellness coach, but I'm on here tonight as a woman. I'm on here tonight as a mom, okay, of a daughter, um, but I'm also on here as a woman who had to deal with it. Unfortunately, I developed very early. I was 12 years old, and I already had that, you know, womanly shape, and of course, at 12, 13, 14, there's no way you can deal with that, and my abuse started very young, and um, some stuff that I don't really recall, I only had the negative aspects of it. I only had the trauma from it, but I don't remember all the details. That's unfortunate, but some of it came out in hypnotherapy. I had two teachers. One started in junior high and was bribing me because um, I wanted to take shop class, and he was the substitute shop teacher, so he let me go in his class and, um, and return for kisses. So I figured, you know, how harmful could it be kiss him on the cheek? And he started with trying to give us gum for that, you know, and, and I just, I wanted to, to, to work in the shop. I wanted the gum and I wanted to work in the shop. And, um, but then it started progressing and he wanted more and he started to stick his tongue in my mouth. And of course I ran out of the room and never went back again. And I blame myself because there was a part of me, even though I was only like 13, 14 years old, there was a part of me that understood what was going on, I guess, because I had had. Um, sexual encounters before that at a very young age, um, maybe because I'm intuitive, but maybe part of me was in denial of it, and the other part of me thought I should have never said yes to taking the shop classes. <laughs> um, so imagine, though, being that a kid and having to deal with that. And imagine now, looking back, do, do we think that that was a bad thing? Would that teacher have been fired? I don't know. Fast forward, yes, he would have been fired. It would have been a lot of trouble. But Women my age will tell you that before laws came out, there was a lot that we had to deal with, and we had no protection. In fact, it was really a man's world. Um, I don't know if people remember, but in the 70s, a woman couldn't even get a credit card by herself. Can you even believe it? Um, so it's, it's like we've come a long way, and at the same time, there's still stuff. And I had a man this week who made a statement on Facebook about how 90, he was going to, he wanted to, teach young girls who want to give seminars at businesses and teach young girls that 99% of men are good. And he went on to say that some women had a problem with him saying that and that he was a misogynist and everything. And I said, well, you know, intimating that 99% of men are good when you're a guy and you have no idea what went on behind closed doors with other women and other men is really a ridiculous statement. How could you say that? Um, I can honestly say more than 99 percent of the population is not is is not good <laughs> I mean look at our look at our statistics of crime look at our statistics of rape and um, and all kinds of sexual harassment and abuse uh, pedophile issues uh, spousal abuse I mean yes there is it against men as well okay am I on here to say that men don't get sexually harassed or that they don't get abused in some way but we know that it's far greater statistic for women. And why is that? Well, because let's just look at us. You know, men are generally much bigger than women. And so we're walking around, women, you know, at a little bit of a deficit because we know the, the amount of rape that's out there. We know that I think it's one in five women will be raped in a lifetime or something like that, uh, one in eight women. I can look at the stat and give it to you in a few minutes. So threat always exists. And, and I, I have not spoken to one single woman who has never had some kind of an encounter with a man that she thought was inappropriate, that made her very uncomfortable, that she didn't know what to do about. So it's happened to probably every single woman in their lifetime at a minimum of once. For me, it was worse because I think being sexually abused as a kid, 
um, I already had this kind of um, aura around me. It was like I was the weakened gazelle and any lion out there just knew they can, they can prance on me. And so I had issues. Plus I developed early and I had, you know, I was like probably 34, 24, 30, 35, 23, 35 or something like that by the time I was, you know, 18 years old, maybe actually younger than that. And so when you develop early and when you have those dimensions, um, you're going to, I think, deal with a lot of impropriety. Men will tell you themselves, they'll say to you, men are dogs. Um, I don't say that. I don't believe that. But I know that they have a lot of sexual thoughts. And I know that being in business with men, especially in the construction business, I had to deal with a lot of that. And it, it, men don't get how that energy and that the intimation of the sexual innuendo and all their jokes that they tell or the remarks that they make or the way they look at you when you leave a room or come in a room or when they're eyeing you. They don't, they, I'm sure some of them are trying not to do it on purpose, but they can't help themselves. But they don't realize that creates discomfort in the per, in the person that they're doing it to and again I don't I'm not here to fault them I'm here to educate I'm here to tell you and if you knew that men were doing it to your daughters to your wives to your sisters to your mothers okay you would have a problem with it you would be upset but yet if it's out it's done you know and, and you, you see another man doing it you don't necessarily say anything you know I've talked to a lot of uh, people in government who said there was tons of stuff going on for decades in what in Washington and they said nothing about it. People who knew the improprieties and, and how many women were harassed and nothing was done or said. And so why? Because men don't tell on men or because they didn't value the woman enough. They didn't see it as so wrong and they let it skip by. And I think that's what the Me Too movement is about, like enough already. Um, we, we need to set guidelines and obviously set rules because there will be people who will take advantage of this, no doubt. Um, I'm sure there'll be there are women that have wrongly accused. I've seen it in my practice where women have wrongly accused husbands who they want a divorce of um, of some kind of physical abuse. Sometimes it's because the woman is just scared. She's just afraid and she wants police involvement because she doesn't want to deal with her husband who's very, very angry because she said, leave. I can understand that because again, we're smaller than you guys, much smaller, sometimes much weaker. I'm 120 pounds. I mean, I've dated guys who were 220, okay, 240, um, six foot, six foot two, six foot four, <laughs> you know, like, and I'm five foot three. So if I don't trust the guy to take, to protect me from himself, okay, then that's going to be, I'm going to be in a scary situation. And unfortunately, because of my background and my childhood, I think I attracted that kind of man into my life. And, and so I've had to deal with a little bit more than maybe a woman who chose really well picked a great guy and doesn't have to deal with that, you know? Okay, so we all have our lot in life. And I picked this life, I chose it, I believe. And I came out here to work it out issues, and I did. I never held it against the men who hurt me or did anything to me, I always forgave. I always continued to love. And I work out there, I actually fight for men's rights and divorce. So I don't hold it against men at all for anything I went through and I don't look at the class of men and you know the whole general population of men as being bad but to think that only 1% or a few percent of men are doing this is absolutely like having blinders on and again if a man it says it says he thinks that that's the statistic then I I ask you why then do you always tell me in conversations that all men are pigs why do you protect your daughter so much why do you make sure that any boy that comes to the house you know you, that they, you know what, what they're what they're about and what their intentions are. Of course, because you know you were a young boy and it was hard for you to control those sexual desires and your testosterone, and so you grew up into a man. And maybe you grew up into a really great man who doesn't do that. Maybe once in a while, when you get drunk, you may flirt in a business meeting or whatever, a uh, business engagement. But but for the most part, you're good. All right. I'm not on here to talk to you. I'm talking, I'm on here to, to, to teach you, to, to reprimand you, I'm saying. I'm on here to teach you that that's not the case. And many and often men will get away with things um, and say things to make women feel uncomfortable and, and will hurt their uh, self-esteem and also their potential in their job. 
Because if we're worried about a, about having to deal with men or anybody in particular on our job or in our, our function as whatever we do, then we're going to have we're going to go in a deficit. We're not going to be as powerful and strong as we can be, or we're going to be on the defensive. And then we get the reputation for being a bitch, but yet all we're really trying to do is is stay grounded, stay strong, and try not to be affected by what another man or what another person is doing to us. So from my perspective um, of the Me Too movement and men saying right now, I don't even want to be in a room with a woman alone, especially the young ones. There's no way I'll take a female intern. I'm only going to take male interns. Okay, I get that. And maybe it's going to take a little while before we feel comfortable again. But in the meantime, instead of being upset or angry about it or being against women because you think that we're all just out there giving false allegations, or if you're afraid of getting in big trouble or a lawsuit or whatever, that's legitimate. Um, so maybe we have to have three people in the room. Or if you do one intern, you need two female interns, you know, or a, boy, a male and a female intern in the room at the same time. I don't know. They do, they do this in doctor's offices, right? And by the way, I was sexually molested by a doctor, okay? It was horrible because they I felt I had total control over me for a short period. I was indecent. I hadn't had my clothes on. It was, hor it was horrible. I actually did have to go to jail. Um, he was caught. And a lot of other women came forward, thank God. But so, you know, like, this is prevalent. It's everywhere. From teachers that I dealt with it to a doctor to another doctor was improper. And his verbiage made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, oh, my God. I had, okay, so when I'm 15 years old, I'm going to tell you this story. I was 15, 16, 17. I was probably 17 or 16 years old when I had a surgery. It's called a pyonidal cyst, which is on the base of your spine, basically where you're your butt cheeks are on the very bottom of your tailbone is it was a like a cyst it's a polynidal cyst and I had it surgically removed and I remember getting wheeled down into the surgical suite and everything and some young guy actually took me down there then I was put to sleep I don't remember anything after that fast forward okay like a year later I'm literally on the golf course watching my father play golf at his country club he was in sudden death Okay, meaning that he was against someone else and I was walking around the course. I had a pair of shorts on, but they were legitimate because it was a country club. Trust me, you can't wear anything too horrible, <laughs> too revealing. And this this guy was following me all over the golf course. And finally, he came up to me and he says, is your name Donna Martini? And I'm like, yeah, I, I am. How do you know me? He said, oh, I was the intern who prepped you for the surgery. He says, I'll never forget that ass anywhere. Okay, this is what happened to me. I didn't know how to respond to that. I'll never forget it. I'm 57 years old. It was, what, 40 years ago? I will never forget that. I can't imagine what he was doing, what he was thinking while I was on the table. It freaked me out. It still freaks me out thinking about it. And this is just one of many. I can't tell you how many jobs I've had where I've had to deal with the off-color jokes, some really disgusting jokes, too. Um, and then the comments about what I'm wearing or, you know, what size bra are you or are your boobs real or, um, yeah, you know, if you walk away now then I can watch you or, I mean, it's on and on and on over the years, not all men, not, I'm not telling you that it's just a lot of them. And if we don't take this seriously, then we're, we're actually allowing it to go on. Then our, our, our girls are going to have to deal with it. But why can't we say now what's right and what's wrong, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate? Why can't we, girl, as women, come out and say, that really makes me feel uncomfortable? I'm up against enough already with what's on the media. Do you want me, you really want to lower my self esteem even more because I can't be a Victoria's Secret model or, you know, I happen to have a, a size breast that, you know, that appeals to men? So what? So I'm 57 years old. When am I going to finally have to stop dealing with that? You know, and or or to want to be attractive or want to look good and then feel bad about it because the message you're giving off. Because if this man says something about the way you're dressing or even a, a girlfriend says it to you, then you're thinking you're you're actually asking for it. We shouldn't have to worry about that. Okay? We should be able to wear biker shorts or we should be able to wear yoga pants or we should be able to wear, you know, uh, form-fitting clothes that let us show our body if we're proud of it because we worked out without being overtly sexual or whatever, we should be able to live our lives and not have to worry about being um, treated in that way. We should have a dialogue with men openly about what it feels like to be objectified. 
And you know what? A lot of us women, we're mature enough. We understand that you have more testosterone than we do and you feel differently about our bodies maybe than we feel about yours, although some of you are still objectified and abused and they're, you're especially abused for how much money you make. We know this, okay? We're not talking about that, though. We're trying to eliminate a situation that's been ongoing for decades and decades and centuries and so to not have to worry as much about our young boys and the way they feel about us, um, to understand that you are sometimes 50 to 100 percent bigger than we are right and so stronger too and muscle have more muscle mass than we do so the idea that when you approach us in a negative way it can make us feel a little intimidated we're going to have to stand up for ourselves and become bigger than life and maybe even get a little offensive or angry or on the on the defense we can't be women and soft and, and, and really embrace our womanhood if we always feel like we're, we're scared of what someone's going to do to us. And we are living with that fear because of how much rape and sexual assault there is. I mean, if guys don't walk around with that fear, do they? Ask yourself. But how many women out there do? You know, we actually do. So anyway, that's the perspective. Um, let's see if we have any questions from friends out there. Okay. Hello, everybody, first of all. Um, Andrew Sa Engineering says, it may even be worse. Most men don't live by Bible principles, don't even respect themselves, much less women. I think, Andrew, that um, today I was trashed so badly by a guy because he, he wrote um, a Facebook post that said, um, you know, what's with all these girls coming on here and asking me for $100 if I want to see them naked, I guess on Skype or whatever. And he says, yeah, well, I'm not paying for it. You know, if you want to come over here, I'll, I'll buy you a, um, a, a Happy Meal and, you, and I'll give you, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a Happy Meal if you do it. And so this was a really off-color joke that offended me. Like I've said, oh my God, he was a friend of me on mine on Facebook. I'm like, if he only understood what that sounded like and it might go out to a lot of people, you know, he's a business owner. Does he really want to go out that way to clients? Clients will come on there. Do they want someone like that in his house, in their house? You know, I'm like, I'm just going to let him know that, that I put a sad face on a post. And I said, I don't know if you realize that it actually is not coming off very well. Um, just coming from a mom and a mother, um, I'm a woman and a, and a mother of a daughter. Well, he came back on and he trashed me. First of all, I did not go on his site and his Facebook page and say that. I wrote it in my news feed. It was in my news feed, you know, <laughs> along with hundreds and hundreds of other posts. And I was called every name in the book. You can't imagine about, I mean, he, first of all, he assumed everything about me. And then I was an Oprah loving leftist, uh, cry. I mean, I mean, it was just on and on and on. <laughs> and um, everything was absolutely the way he spoke about me everything he actually said was wrong okay and saying i hate blue work color workers i hate this i, I, I. <sighs> let me take a deep breath basically it, it made me cry not because of what he said to insult me i think you know that doesn't matter i i know who i am it was because i couldn't believe that such negativity exists like i'm so tired of it i'm so sick and tired of the judgment and the ridicule and the name calling and the abuse and the verbiage and everything that we do to one another like what what is it going to come down to like what kind of world do we want to live in when we're constantly out there abusing one another it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense what does everybody really want they want to be loved we were born to do this why do we want to be so horrible to one another it's like I'm so and I can't work fast enough I cannot work fast enough to try to help people I can't write enough I can't write enough books to be able to do this I don't know to what degree I have to go out there in this world to be able to get the point across that being healthy in our mental state and our emotional state and loving more is so much better than being in that negativity living every day with that anger it's just not healthy overall and will never bring happiness okay never so why why don't we want to finally seek happiness and why don't we finally want to realize that judging other people and trashing them and oh my god how many posts last week did we have to see about this school chancellor or whoever she is the secretary of education and how, what an idiot moron she was how many people had to put that video on and show what a moron she is okay first of all if you're a teacher or in that profession 
Why are you bullying someone? You don't want our kids to do it. Why are you doing it? You can have an issue with everything that she says, but to insult and ridicule to this degree and trash her and bash her and everything else, you know what? Some people don't come off well on video. Some people don't come off well on camera. I'm not one. When someone's throwing negativity at me, I kind of get stuck. I'm not sticking up for her as far as what she knows or doesn't know. Okay? But here's the deal. Before she ever came in, the school system had a lot of issue. A lot of issue. So somebody was running it before her that got it to that point. But I don't see you calling them morons or assholes or whatever else you're calling this woman. And that's just to show that we are, you know, when we're politically aligned one way, we have to trash the other way to feel okay about what's going on in the world. And I don't get that. I don't get it. I never trashed Obama. And I am never going to trash Trump. Okay? I might say things about what he does and what he says. But when it comes down to it, Ridicule does nothing for me and it will do nothing to get my point across because it will only alienate. It might ingratiate some, but it will alienate others. So instead, talk about what's going on, talk about the results, talk about how we can fix it, talk about what more we can do. All these people that, chance that were trashing the Secretary of Education, did they come up with any ideas? Did they offer her any advice? Did they put in some good programs or toss their hat in there in the ring to say, hey, I want to help, I want to volunteer? You know, no, I don't hear any of that. I just hear trashing. What good is that? Where is it going to get us? And this Me Too movement now, which is the reason why I came on tonight, is it going to help to ridicule women? Really, to come on and, and, and insult and, and, and make me feel bad because I have an opinion about something really off color and, and almost pedophile-like you put on Facebook? I, 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 sarcasm or not, it's still not good. It's still sending the wrong message. Okay, so you did it. And because I'm your friend, I actually put out there, maybe I should have private messaged you, but nothing I said was, was, was offensive. It was just that maybe you don't realize this is off color. This is not, that's it. But to be trashed for that, okay? And to be trashed for how I feel, this is just showing abuse. It's just showing the ability to be abusive. And maybe it's showing that you're defending the idea that you think like this and you act like this. I, I get it. I get it. Uh, and I'm not going to ridicule you for it, you know? I'm not. I'm just going to... I'm just going to ask people who care, not the people who don't care because I can't get to you. I'm going to ask the people to, that care to, to just think about what they say, think about what they do, think about the effect it has from their own body and the way it resonates with themselves to the point where it's resonating out in the energy that they're giving out. This is cumulative. We're all dealing with this negativity. And it's really hurting us as a nation. It's hurting us as a people. It's hurting our kids. It's causing stress. Everything. Everything that we're seeing right now and drug use and everything else. Don't think that it doesn't come back to our own abuse to one another, to the, the energy that they're feeling, in addition to the food they have to eat and the Wi-Fi and everything else that's going on in their bodies. They don't have anything to hold on to. There's no love. There's no goodness. Where's the sharing? Where, where is the camaraderie? Where's the community? We're so separate and divided now. It's, it's crazy the way, the way that we're going on and on and on. And, and I, you know what? This whole last week, I'm saying to myself, okay, you can blame Trump all you want, but we were like this before. And the people who are blaming Trump for, for, for doing what he's doing, ridiculing everything else, you're ridiculing the ridiculer. So, like, what does that make any sense? Like, do we have to keep on listening to how our president sucks or whatever else in order to change this country? Aren't we going to somehow, some way, somebody get up and say, here's a better way? Okay, instead of trashing someone else. And then Hillary Clinton, what she was doing this week and what she was saying when I was hearing about her, I was like, oh my God, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I've already gotten so sick over it. The way people feel and judge. All of them, every one of them, Republicans to Democrats, all across the board. We're all guilty of this. We're all guilty of this. We, if, even if I'm doing it in my head, I'm guilty of it. I'm trying to get to the point where I never, ever say it out loud. But beyond that, I've, and I've, I think I've accomplished that. I've tried. But I want it to be so I'm never doing it here either, where I'm never doing it here, where it comes out pure love to start so I don't have to manipulate out of anything. And trust me, that's not an easy way to live initially, but once you get going with it and you realize that love is the only thing that you should be filling yourself up with, what other fuel do you want? 
What other fuel is as good as love? Do you want anger? Because anger, righteous indignation can get you somewhere. It can help to a degree. I, 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 I say righteous indignation is not so bad, but when you do it without the love, it's ridiculed, judgment, and it doesn't get us anywhere. I'm gonna turn some light on in here. Just give me a second, I'll be right back, because it's getting dark. Okay, that might be too light, but whatever, at least I'm not in the dark here. <laughs> Sorry, the nighttime change. All right, let's, I'm on a roll here tonight. I am so sorry, but it's it's really, it's sadness that I don't want it to be sad anymore. I want it to be power. Um, I want to stand up. I want to talk more about this. I want people to start realizing what they're doing to us, one another, and how this is playing out. I'm very empathic about energy. I can feel it. So I know I'm, what I'm saying is true, that what we're putting out there in our verbiage and our conduct is creating an energy that is damaging. It's making people sick. It's making people unhappy. Uh, some even claim suicidal, okay, with all the things that we're dealing with here in this country. We, do we have to hate one another? No, that's not going to help us. Until we come together and then rise up and, and create an uprising of love, we're going to have worse health problems than you've ever seen. The World Health Organization said a couple of years back that the number one cause of, of, of uh, death, okay, by the year 2025, is going to be heart disease, okay? Heart disease, what does that mean? What's going on with the heart when our hearts are broken, when our hearts aren't filled, when our hearts aren't full of joy, okay? What's the number two killer they're saying? I, they're claiming it, not me. The number two killer in the year 2025, they claim, will be suicide. What does that say about us? What does that say about our world and how we've gotten it? And when I say we, I mean everybody. I mean me too. I mean, I'm going to step it up every day, even more, okay, compensating for negativity, getting rid of everything in my life that is negative, and, and coming back to being grounded every minute, the best food, uh, no more meat, okay, I was almost a vegetarian, and then I went back to eating some meat because of my doctor, I'm like, screw it, I'm going to be plant-based again, no more television, I'm getting rid of Wi-Fi, I'm going to start reading my news again because it's just too difficult to listen to the opinion with the energy and everything else attached. I'm just like going across the board, everything I can. Anybody has any suggestions out there for me to have what they do to stay grounded? I'm all ears, okay? But I am going to get to the point where I am a love machine, okay? <laughs> That's all I'm going to be doing. And everything I write, and everything I say is going to have the most love I can possibly attach to it. So nobody's going to misinterpret what I'm saying or my intention. And that's a promise. I swear to you, it's a promise. All right, let's see. Who else? I'm sorry I'm such a crybaby tonight. It's actually, there's some tears of joy in there because I am coming into my power. I'm maybe getting sick and tired of it all. It's making me just want to move more and not care. I don't really care anymore if I offend people who are on the other side of this, meaning that they don't want to come together and don't want to unite. I would rather pull my power up and allow myself that few percent who are going to hate me than to not do this and not rise up in myself, okay? Um, I can't be Mother Teresa, don't have her, <laughs> not a nun, okay? I can't be Gandhi, don't have his intelligence, can't be Martin Luther, no, don't have his doctorate, don't have his potential, don't have his argument, you know? I, I, I have what I have, I'm Donna Martini, and I'm gonna do whatever I can to get out there to, to speak about what is real, what's real and what we can change, because we're waiting around for everybody else to create change and we're blaming everybody else for what's happening and what are we doing? We can rise up, we're the people. And we can do so much, what are we doing, okay? Okay, so let's see. Robert Force says, our culture has changed. God bless you, Donna, you have such a great soul. Thank you. I'm trying to let, you know, we all have great souls, to be honest, but we don't all let our souls come out. It's just a percentage of time that I'm trying to let my soul out versus my ego self. Okay, here you, you see a mixture of ego and soul here. <laughs> um, so, but the more soul we have, the softer we get, the more beautiful our verbiage, the more beautiful our actions, the more creative and intense our, idea, our ideas are, the more profound they are, the more potential we have to change things that isn't working, the more connections we make. <laughs> it's just being in the soul, and you all have that. You all have exactly what I have. 
It's just the human self that needs more desire to have it, you know? And that's what we're experiencing now. When we see ridicule, name calling, hatred, and everything else we see on this on this uh, social media or in the newspaper or on television, it's just people staying in their ego self. They're not coming to the soul. The soul would pretend a, a beautiful, you know, would, would, would show, would not pretend a horror. It would show a beautiful aspect. It would show what we can do. It would show the truth. And it wouldn't alienate like that. It would create a symbiotic outcome, you know, and people would resonate with it and come to the middle more. And that's what we really need in our leadership. And Okay, we know we can't have that in our president now. So let's not bark up that tree anymore. Let's find ways to do it ourselves. We're not beholden to him or anyone, as, as a matter of fact, on the left or the right. We can do what we want. We create the movements. Martin Luther King didn't wait around for a president, although the presidents did ingratiate themselves. Gandhi didn't wait around for the president. He talked to the president. He created that with the presidents that he, when he was, you know, in charge of his uh, groups and his um, peace movement. So he created the movement. He was the president of his movement, if you want, right? But then he had to affect change in leaders by being a great leader. They had to listen to him once he rose up and he showed right from wrong. And so that's what we can do right now. We don't need to sit and, and, and complain and whine. You know, oh, it's the worst thing in the world to whine. Um, Michael Anthony says, despise men like that. You know what, Michael? We got to love them more. To be honest, we have to love them more. I know what, how you feel because it just you want to despise someone like that. But truthfully, the, the man who trashed me on Facebook, he admitted that he got raised. He loved women and he was raised by three of them, not a man in sight for miles. What does that say? He had no male role model to show him how to be a man. And that's that's really terrible. And guess what? We have a culture right now where so many young boys and girls do not have their dads. We have screwed up divorce laws um, that work against men. We have uh, lots of child uh, fatherless homes and, and women having babies without dads, which, you know what, I'm not criticizing them for it, but, but this is the situation. They're more, those kids are more at risk for all kinds of behavior that you know, will cause issues in our society later, all right? At any rate, I, I understand how you feel, but my instinct is to say, love them more. Love them more. Bring out their soul as much as you can by bringing out your soul. Soul to soul, at least they can rise. And you know what? After I did that with this guy and I prayed for him inside and I wrote him back an email and I, you know, I just told him that you're, you're very, you're, you're, I am deaf, totally blue collar all the way. I told him I became as humble as I could. And you know what? He still was pissed at me. But he took the post down. He at least took the post down. I think he realized the way it made him sound. Maybe when he went back to read it, maybe someone said to him. Or maybe he just didn't want to uh, to have, you know, he listened after all. After all is said and done. He also unfriended me, which was fine. Um, but the point is that loving him more had a positive effect. He stopped coming back at me, and he, he actually took the post down, right? Okay, Robert Force says, the media has divided us, pushing their agenda. Again, Robert, you're blaming the media. Who's watching television? Who's posting Facebook posts? Okay, you could you could blame media all you want, but we're the ones who are buying into it. We're the ones who want to watch those channels and want to be fueled and want to get all that negative information so we can use it the next day in the office and trash our president or trash our, our other elected officials or trash the left, trash the right, whatever, okay? So again, we have to stop blaming. We have to stop. We have that again, working against us, no doubt. No doubt, I'll admit it, okay? But what did I do? I'm taking cable down. I'm getting rid of it. I'm not listening to it. I'm gonna get my news in another way. I'm gonna research out the best newspapers that I can find that are not so left or right, okay? And maybe I have to spend a little bit of time reading their opinions on the left and the right because sometimes I have to combat that opinion with, with different dialogue, not combat it with, with um, as a fight. Okay, I don't mean it that way. I don't get into, I don't want to be in a, a negative fight with somebody. I combat it with other stats or other information or another viewpoint. And so because of my radio show, I do that. So basically, I have to know what everybody thinks. Um, but to feel it at the same time and be a part of it, no, I don't have to do that. I'm not paying $200 a month 
to listen to people's opinion, <laughs> when, especially when their opinion is tainted, slanted, and most of the time so myopic, they don't even see anything in the middle. And they're missing out on so much that would make them actually sound, hello, smarter. Okay? But anyway, um, Lisa Spatola says you're doing good. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, I feel like such a mush tonight, but you know what? We're going to we're going to create change because it's going to take heart to do it. All right? It's not going to take a brain. It's going to take heart because we've had a lot of very very smart people with PhDs and doctorates leading this country. Everybody's got a degree. Everybody has to have a degree. All these different schools and who's from Harvard and who's from here and who's from Yale. Our country is a mess. It's a mess and we're being led by very smart people, which means that you just can't be smart. You have to be loving, kind, and willing to do what's right. Not just be right. You can't just want to be right. You have to do right. You have to do what's right and good for the whole. Okay, we can't put opinion, we can't put ego in, we have to put soul in. That's what we need. That's what those leaders of the past that we know so well, and that we, I keep saying their names over and over again, like Gandhi and everyone else. Hey, if Oprah wants to run for president, I don't know if she'd be a good president. I don't know what her agenda is, but you know, I do know she'll bring in heart. At least she'll bring in heart. And she actually said that she would meditate or pray, and, and if God told her to run for president, she would. And she, I thought that was awesome, but I heard too that she was trashed for it because the left trashed Bush because he used to pray about things that he did in leadership. That's so sad. That's so sad because if you can call it God, you can call it whatever, there is a higher knowing within all of us. We are connected to all the information in the world. We're one. Cellularly speaking, we can glean information from each one of us. And that, what is that? That's just community. Call it God, call it energy, call it love, call it whatever you want. But if we go outside of ourselves, and have that intention to do what's right and good on the for the whole, for the bigger picture, then we're already tapped into more than ourselves. So call whatever you want. A leader who's tapped in is what we want. A leader is coming from the soul and the heart, that's what we want. And combining, of course, with an IQ and intelligence. Okay. Um, Robert Force says N22. I don't know what that means. Please come back on and show tell me what that means. I have no idea. Tina Landy says, we need it strong. I'm hoping you mean my dialogue because I'm pouring it on tonight. Um, she, she says, yes, reading is good. Okay, cool. Um, Michael Anthony says, I like to read too. I mean, this is what we should be doing. Don Hockler, I'm so glad. Please join in this because you are a consummate professional. I adore you. You've always been such a gentleman all the time. And I appreciate that. So I, I don't really tell that many men how much of a gentleman they are because I don't want to contrast it to the men that are out there that aren't gentlemen to me. But I should. I should go out there and just really say to you what a great job. And your son, he was a beautiful boy. I met, well, I call him a boy. I met him when he was in his early, early 20s, maybe just out of school. But he was a nice young man, and I adored him. And, um, and I'm hoping he's successful too. And, and it, it shows. It shows the way you raised him. Uh, Tina Landy says, get rid of all negative people in your life that does not support the greatness you're trying to accomplish. Tina, you know, it, that would make sense. But guess what? The people who are in a negative state of being are the ones who need me the most. And I'm not, it's, I'm not about calling them up and saying, hey, come over for dinner. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. People who, who I can tell are in a state of being that are not coming from the soul. All right, You want to be and hang out with and enjoy the company and a meal with someone who's really on the same journey as you and who can who you're lifting them, they're lifting you, they're learning from you, you're learning from them, and it's a beautiful exchange. That's awesome. But listen, in work, I, I mean, in my volunteer work and my regular work, I have to deal with people all day long that are not in a really good state of mind or being. They have anger issues or they're just not um, – I'm not going to call about a levels or anything like that, but their awareness of their own soul isn't as as great as it could be. And so they're coming out and creating a difficult situation for other people. Let's just say it that way, okay? So what are we going to do? We can't avoid this in our life. It's going to happen. So we, we have to be stronger. We have to lift up. We have to be able to engage our heart. I picture it as a machine spinning around. If you ever want to look up Metatron's cube, M-E-T, 
a T R O N cube. Okay. Metatron was an archangel, but the cube is also called the flower of life. And it says to be the essence of, uh, in everything that exists. And I, I, I've been led and guided to this kind of um, mechanism that we can picture in our heart that spins two ways. It spins in one direction and the other direction. It's a tetradon, I think. And I picture my heart as that. I literally make it into that little machine and bring in that energy. And I spin it and I picture energy of love coming out of my heart. And I do this because it makes me stick with the intention of love. It makes me stop my ego voice right away or any triggers that somebody is giving right away it shuts them down and lets me be more in my power which is awesome um it automatically has the ability to affect the other person's soul so if that other person i'm not trying to manipulate them but i'm definitely manipulating my own energy and that will have an effect on the energy we share so if he or she is spewing anger at me or even if i feel more anger coming on because of stuff that they're saying because they're so their, their soul is just not talking to them or their, their, their ego is just so powerful in their, their head right at that moment. I will put the, pour the love on so that they have a better shot at coming into the love. Because if I'm in a negative state and they're in a negative state, no hope, okay, for us trying to resolve this uh, issue that we're having or to end this beautifully. Because sometimes you just need to walk away, but you want to end it well. So by pouring on that love and that machine in my chest, I am creating an energy that they can actually um, come into and uh, embrace, ingratiate, embrace, so that they have the ability to maybe rise up in their own soul. That that makes sense, right? Because if they've turned off their soul voice and if they're truly in the ego, if they aren't able to get there on their own, then perhaps they can use my energy because I just gave it to them. I just gave them the love rose up and unconditionally loved them, gave them the benefit of the doubt that they want to be in their soul if they could get there. And so here's their opportunity. And sometimes, almost all the time, I should say, there is a definite positive change. Sometimes it eradicates it completely. Sometimes it just lets me know I've done enough and I've got to you know, get away from the situation. Sometimes you don't know when you leave the effect that you might have had. They might change their behavior going forward. Maybe they won't admit it to you because their ego is dictating that, but they might change for the better themselves because of what you did for yourself by not being triggered by them. It's so powerful. If we can do this in our relationships, oh my gosh, in our marriage, in our children's relationship with our children, it, it would just, it changes everything. It changes everything. It has for me. It's been my most profound, I think, realization. Um, and it was funny because it was triggered. This whole I, this whole episode was triggered by um, a really bad breakup in a relationship I had about five, six years ago. It was that man who I know just literally turned my heart on and opened it. I don't know how because I guess it's just soul to soul work. Um, it just happened. And then when he left, my heart was broken, but I used that love that I had for him to heal myself and to love him more, even though it ended, you know, so, so tragically and hurtfully. I didn't want to hate him. I didn't want to stop loving him, even if I couldn't be with him. And I wanted to be able to have a positive effect on him even after I was gone. So I poured on the love and I was led and guided to all of these amazing abilities we have to change energy, to manipulate energy, to love one another more, to change the outcome of our events, to protect ourselves from negativity and things that people can do, to heal relationships that have been horrible forever. I've helped people who were out of a marriage for 15 years and hated their spouse to come back together in a more positive way. If, if we're willing, we could do just about anything. Because why? When we're willing to bring on love, we have the power of love behind us. We have the power of whatever you want to call it. I call it God. You can call it whatever you want. But we have that as to tap into instead of just being on our own in our own ego self. We're just human. We're just our own intellect. This, you'd have to have 17,000 degrees in every kind of medical philosophy, psychology, and everything else in order to uh, know how to heal every situation or how to heal a person if you don't even especially if 
if you're in your own woes. You can't see straight when you're in your own woes and your own pain or your own triggers are going off. Or your own drama is happening in your own body and your own mind. You can't see straight, okay? Even if you have all those degrees. So instead, by saying, okay, I want to love more in this situation, I want to overcome my ego. I want to overcome this trigger right now. I want to love more. And you picture that heart spinning. Even if it hurts you, even if you're pissed off, even if you don't want to do it, even if the other person doesn't deserve it, it doesn't matter. You do it anyway. The more you practice, the easier it gets, the better life gets for you. The more love you have, the more you're filled up, the more powerful you become. You get to discern better. You get to, um, you, you get to have profound answers come into your questions. You get to, like... When people come to you and you can resolve issues like that because you're tuned in to so much more than just your own head. It's awesome. I don't know why everybody doesn't want to do this. Once, once I teach you, though, I'm sure you will because if you if just listen to me tonight and if you just try it tomorrow and you see the outcome, you're going to be like floored and you're going to want to teach the next person because that's basically all it is. I don't have a gift that you don't have. I just know how to use it right now. <laughs> or I'm learning more. I actually don't even know how to do it you know, like I do it as much as I can. I want to get to the point where it's always on. I'm working towards that, but we can work towards it together, you know? All right, who else? Let's see. Uh, Michael said I would unfriend him immediately. Well, he unfriended me, Michael, so I don't have to worry about that. We're talking about the guy who trashed me on Facebook. Robert Force says, true, who is funding the media? Um, we are funding them, right? Because the ratings are, they're, they're doing it because the ratings are so high when they come on and they opinion, they opine and they trash. <laughs> it's just a fact because if you don't like Trump, you're going to want to listen to people who don't like Trump. You want to validate your negative emotions. You want to validate the anger you're feeling. Or maybe it's fear underneath the anger because most of the time it is. I think that Trump haters have a fear of things that he can do and say. I don't blame you. Um, any, but I, we could we could be fearful of anyone because the, the other side was fearful of what Hillary Clinton would do, taking away their rights. And so that was a true fear. And so they, they love to hear the other side and all the trashing against her. So basically, it is us who needs to change that. We need at least the desire to change that and the desire to not live like that anymore. And who knows, if we were to do that, if we were to stop that negativity, who would we vote for then? Who would be coming up the ranks? And who, what kind of person would we be able to elect because we'd be more loving and caring about each other's philosophies and rights and everything else, right? Okay. I'm thinking we would be we would be electing some amazing people in all facets of government, by the way. Tina says knowledge is golden. Knowledge is great, but wisdom is better. Okay? Wisdom, because I can learn all I can learn and grab so much knowledge in my head. But what will that help me when I'm with someone who's combating me, who's really in their own pain or their own agony, their own anger? How is knowledge going to help me at that moment? It's love and the idea that I want to say the right thing to diffuse the issue or to help the other person. And when I intend that and I say that, wisdom comes in to my right ear. I'm like so smart. I can't believe it. <laughs> like I couldn't possibly know the answers on my own. And so I give all the power to the powers that be for gracing me. But I also am the one who made the decision to, to do, to accept that as grace instead of staying in my ego head. Now I'm getting to the point, like I said, I want to do this all the time because it's so awesome. But when we're stuck, when we're upset, when we're, we're, when we're, um, so da, 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 what's the word I'm using for self-protecting? Right when we're in protection mode against somebody who's triggering us or slamming us or or spewing crap at us, or especially when they're so angry that their anger and their energy from the anger is blowing us away. They can literally feels like you have to protect yourself and you have to put like arm guard uh, armor on you just to protect yourself. It's like it's like bullets going through you. And and for me, being empathic and really feeling other people's energy, it does blow me away. I'm going to acknowledge that. So I have to remember to wrap myself right away in protective armor. And but also I've learned that just pouring on that hard energy means that the love is coming out and that's like a protective factor and that side of kind of neutralizes i think and then it over eventually overwhelms the negativity but i have to get there here i have to get there in my own state of being 
so that because the more that I'm the more I intend love the more love will be there but the more I am able to fill my own self with the love the more powerful that love becomes just like the anger had power to hurt me or to weaken me the love energy has the power to overwhelm the other person if they choose to be in the soul they can still choose to hate me and be mad and it's their own decision but they have more chance more of a, a it's more opportunity for them to exchange with love if I'm at least backing down and then becoming stronger in the way I feel because my intention is to love them not hate them you know or not judge them okay so Lisa says oh Robin where says always be the light worker um, Tina Landis says oh please I don't know what that means um, I'm, I, I don't know if you're upset with me for saying that we should not be around negative people I don't know but you can confirm that Lisa says Oprah can can't run for president she said she's African-American oh my god I just I, I just lost what you said I'm sorry it just went up on this on the scroller um, Jorge says we men need to develop greater levels of conversational competence as well as emotional intelligence um, I think it's probably um, emotional intelligence is the emotional right I think that all of us need to do that I think uh, women may have more intuition on certain levels because we're mothers and we're made to be in more in tune with what the child's needs are because we're the nurturers the ones that were you know that we give birth to them and we're trying to raise them from infant on when they can't talk so we do have a lot of natural instincts that men have to develop for sure but they all have them um, but I think all of us need to just be more honest about the way things make us feel and before this before this me too movement a woman couldn't say like I had an issue with a board that I was on and the head of the board was making really horrible statements to me asking about dates asking if I had sex on my dates when I went on them was super and in, in, you know like personal intrusive and told disgust one disgusting joke to me once and I just sat there at lunch and I was like I was mortified and I didn't feel like I had the ability to say anything to anybody. I was I was trying to let him know because he had some power over me, and I didn't want to make an issue. But now I think there's more power for us. This was several years ago, but now we, there's more power that I could have said to him. You know, that could be interpreted badly. Maybe that's not a statement that would be appropriate. Like I I would feel empowered to say that now when I didn't feel empowered not that long ago because I would be the one that would actually be dealing with it. In fact. A huge percentage of women who come out against sexual harassment and abuse are ridiculed and are not they what they say is not accepted so you feel worse after the fact so now I think this me too movement is allowing us to set just have a conversation and say you know that makes me feel uncomfortable you know I don't want to insult you but that really isn't something that I want to hear is that okay I mean even just that way I mean if the guy keeps going with it or he gets offended by it then that you know what then we take it to this next step because it I mean come on who would deny you who what nice guy would deny you that after you saying it right Tim Landy I'm a hairstylist and deal with all types of people I get what you're saying I think that being a hairstylist oh my goodness you're dealing with people's energy and you're touching them I can't even imagine and I talk to hairstyles about this all the time I actually teach some of them how to protect themselves because you know although a hair hairstyle is generally with people when they're in a better state of being because they're actually getting their hair done and they might feel better but they also are um, looking at the hairstylist sometimes as a sounding board or as a therapist and you're dealing with so much you're taking on so much energy from other people so it's really tough for you you need you need this practice I, to inbox me because I will absolutely help you you know I coach for free so don't even worry about that but if you want some more help on how to protect I'm here for you okay Tina Landy says flower of life whom I like that I'm definitely inbox me I got so much I could teach you okay so Michael Anthony says what inspired you to do this do you mean the um, heart movement um, okay it started when I was meditating it's 5 755 so I'm gonna say this quickly it started when I was meditating I would be sitting in lotus position in my yoga studio downstairs in my house and I would be moving in this weird way okay and I noticed that the movement 
was a, the flower. You know the spiral? You remember Spirograph when you did the spiral all the way around and it created that flower? Well, when I was a kid, I was mesmerized by that. And even before that, when I was really young and I couldn't pay attention in school because I had the dyslexia and I didn't know and I had attention deficit and I didn't know, to pay attention and to hear better, I would doodle. And I would make that design over and over and over again on my paper, which is that little flower, you know, around and around and around. And so when I was doing it in my meditation, I was like, wow, this is really strange. And I was in like a zone and I had this Kundalini experience. I can't explain, but I felt like a, a surge go through my body of energy and I'm like, whoa, you know, and I'm, I'm not one to, you know, teach that. I, I, I did yoga for years, but I never taught Kundalini, didn't even really understand it until I had the experience, and then I started researching it. But that, that whole design was stuck in my head, and then I started doing it all the time. I, was, I would be sitting in meditation, all of a sudden my body would move on its own. Fast forward to when I was sick just a few couple of years ago, and I went to a, um, I had an intuitive healer I worked with. We did the work over the phone, and basically she said to me, I want you to lay on the couch and do absolutely nothing. I'm going to hang up with you. I'm going to look into your body. I'm going to do some meditation with you. I'm going to come back on and call you in 45 minutes. Okay, so fine. That was fine. I I'm, was told by other people that she was amazing, that she could really tap into the body, even even remotely. She was a – I can't remember where she was, upstate, some, uh, New Hampshire possibly, or Maine. Maine, that's where she was. And so I hung up the phone, I laid on my couch, and I just zoned out for, for, you know, like 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and just trying to get relaxed and started deep breathing. Within a minute, I felt something going on in my chest. I felt like there was a machine in there. And I heard this noise, like, like that. And I had no idea what was going on. In fact, I let it go for a little bit because I was so mesmerized by it and like, what the heck is it? And then I actually got scared. I had no idea what was going on in my body, but my chest felt like there was a mechanism in it, like a chick, 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 like that. So I tried to get myself settled on it. went away. As soon as I started getting scared, it actually went away. And I sat there and I laid there in meditation and she called me back in 45 minutes and she said, so how was the, your experience? Did you feel anything? She asked me that right away. And I'm like, oh, my God, I cannot tell you this crazy thing happened to me. And I described it, and she starts laughing. She said, that's Metatron. Metatron was there. I actually brought him in to protect you and to, you know, because he's your, he's basically was part of my guiding uh, experience. I don't know. I, I don't know how she worked. I had never worked with her before. And I... She told me it was that was Metatron's cube, and I had heard of that. Like in the back of my mind, I said that sounds familiar, but I couldn't really remember it. I hung up with her after the session. She gave me a lot of great information. She was actually part a big part of my healing process. Um, but the experience changed me forever. I went online and I started looking up Metatron's cube, and I saw it as this mechanism, the tetradon, I think it's called, and how it's spinning. And I could picture that that's what was going on in my body when I heard that going right. I just, but then when I realized that Metatron's cube is attached to the flower of life, and I saw the picture of the flower of life, which was with that spiral, and I realized that I had been doing that since I was a little girl, I couldn't even imagine. I actually called her back and I told her, no, I, or I wrote to her, and she said that most likely I've had him, you know, Metatron as a, some kind of a, a safety feature, because Metatron was, was definitely a protector. And was the only human uh, archangel that was once human and not an angel first. And all these different things behind it. Now, let me tell you, you're probably listening to me thinking I'm absolutely nuts. Okay? And I could tell you that if I was listening to this story, I might think the same thing. But guess what? It happened to me. And I'm using it. And I'm picturing that love. And I'm literally changing the dynamics of my relationships changing things remotely. I can change things through the internet. I can change things through emails. When I spin that Metatron's cube in my chest, I am literally feeling a difference in myself and it's coming out of my verbiage and what I do, what I say, how I interact with people, and I'm getting a different response from others. 
Okay, so fast forward then after doing this for a while, being led to the science behind it, understanding how we are emitting energy out of our hearts, okay? Understanding that actually could be um, tested on machinery that we have now. So science can see that. Then find coming to find that our hearts actually work faster than our brains. So in other words, our, once we make the decision to love more, our hearts are already moving. They're already done. It's already going. It's like it's happening already. So it's 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 like um it's crazy because there's no such thing as time when it comes to our intention to love. It just happens. It can actually move backwards and change your relationship from a week ago if you do it now. So it's just awesome. So okay, so so again, you think I'm nuts, but basically science is showing me this and telling me that what's going on in my body and what I'm, my intentions are and the, what I'm creating is actually there may be science behind it. We can measure love energy. We can measure gratitude, compassion. And guess what? Compassion actually has the highest resonation in our body. So when we feel compassion, it resonates to us on a cellular level and it emits out of us, okay, as an aura. And that's really cool because what I was saying before about not wanting to be around negative people, like everybody says we should run from negative people, and instead have more compassion and more love that imagine those two energies together in our body and how that resonates and how we hum at like this amazing vibration for whatever amount of time we can hold on to that. And if we're spinning in that and we're pulling on our Metatron's cube and pouring out that love energy, then how much then uh, do we potential does the other person have for, for possibly tapping into their own soul? Because it's my belief that there are people who can't see their own soul, hear their own soul very well. So maybe they can see it through us when we trigger it and we do that because we love them and we know their soul is there and we know that their human self got stuck, but we're going to love them more despite that. We're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. When we do that, that may be the only time of the day they really get to see their soul too. Maybe just through us. So imagine trying this. Imagine doing it more often. Maybe you can't do it when you're really in a defensive state or when someone's really slinging it at you or hurting you or whatever you're triggered or you're triggered. Sometimes we can be triggered by minor things, but hey, a trigger is a trigger and it usually happened from something very profound in the past. So the small thing that's happening to us right now is triggering a big, 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 big thing and it's harder for us to hold on to this. Okay, start with easy stuff. Start with your mother's pissing you off. You love her anyway. So just do the heart thing and see if it calms her down. See if it changes her energies. If your mom's anxiety ridden, your child anxiety ridden, instead of being, you know, telling them not to have anxiety or trying to talk them out of it, pour on the love. See their soul. See their gift. Let them rise up in that, right? Give them the benefit of the doubt that they're in their ego, but their soul's right there. Tap into that pour on the heart energy and see what happens. It always has such a profound effect. And it takes us out of defensive mode, um, which is ego, okay? And when you were ego to ego, there's no good outcome, trust me. But if we were to pour on that love, we're automatically protected by the love, so we don't have to be in a protective mode. We might go back and forth. I found myself going back and forth from ego to soul, ego to soul, like within seconds of talking to somebody who's really a bad state of being, but or really attacking me in a way, or maybe be but I realized later on the verbiage that they were giving me wasn't really as bad as the energy they were sitting in. They were sitting in horrible energy, and I was feeling that energy. It was negative. It was hatred. It was anger. And then it made me realize, holy crap, if they're sitting in that, and I was the object of their letting it out at that moment, first of all, I have an obligation to try to fix that in myself and not trigger that person again. B, what kind of state of being they're in, are they in? You know, like, can I help them? So by doing this love thing, I'm actually maybe giving them the opportunity to heal a little bit because someone is loving them unconditionally and wants to help them out of it, irrespective of the fact that they're tr they're being trashed. You know, like, that's a, that's a huge amount of love, you know? So by wanting to do that and trying it whenever I can, and let me tell you something, being on Facebook, it does it happens more often than you think, right? So if by wanting to do it, um, we're immediately lifted, spiritually blessed, graced by a higher power, changing the energy between ourselves and the other, giving the other person a potential to be able to lift up themselves, 
giving them nothing to bounce off of because we're not in the ego. So they can't go ego to ego with us anymore if we're, if we're sold in their ego, right? So we're at least one up on them as far as, um, and I don't mean one up meaning better than, I mean, we're one up meaning we're most likely to come out okay. <laughs> And I'm not talking about winning because the, we won the second we turn on our heart. That's the winning. The winning is not going down the ego rabbit hole. Okay. So basically, though, we will uh, win when we have a symbiotic outcome. So when we're both okay in the situation, it's a win win. Otherwise, if it's a win loss, it's never a win. That's my opinion. Okay. Um, Paul, John Paul says, You have degrees in common sense. I have no degrees at all through schooling or through earthly means. But I guarantee you that the last 57 years of my life, I've earned quite a few degrees in unconditional love from our higher knowing and a higher power. Um, definitely feel like I've got a PhD in unconditional love for sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Tina Landy says, ah, oh, okay. I'm, I don't, I'm okay. I hope that means that you're going to uh, inbox me. <laughs> and she says, thank you. Okay. John Paul says, out but need a coach. We can work it. Um, I don't know what that means, John, but if you need me, you know you, you, where you can get me. And we have um, Michael Hartlip says, assuming you could find amazing and great people to take the job of trying to fix this country, no easy task. I think that a really kind person who is a loving person and a gentle soul is going to be terrified of doing this job because of the way this country is. I just heard tonight watching a special about Robin Williams that when he made that movie um, with the doctor, you remember the doctor who uh, who created a, a hospital? Oh my gosh, I'm so bad at names. He created a hospital for children, um, for people in general and children that you'd have to pay. Um, he created that movie, which I thought was brilliant and beautiful, and he was amazing in it. Guess what? The critics trashed him. They trashed him because he had won the Academy Award for um, Goodwill Hunting, and they felt that this was a downslide. Like this man, who's brilliant in every way and so talented, had to be trashed by people because he wanted to do something beautiful that shows a, a, something good about a man's life. Can you imagine? How did that lead towards his suicide, I wonder? Because... Basically, if he's out in the public eye to that degree and everything he does is scrutinized, everything beautiful thing, especially want to do something out of love and goodness. It doesn't have to win an award, okay, but to be trashed for it. So imagine then somebody coming out to run for president or run for an office, like me, for instance. Am I going to run for office? I have great ideas, but I would be mutilated, absolutely mutilated and could I handle that and would I want to and would I want to threaten my body and my health and everything else for it you'd have to be just become numb to it and I don't know if that's what I'm supposed to be doing as a human being I'm better off as a whisperer in the in the year of the politician or the government leader but my point is that there are a lot of good leaders I bet who right now in this climate could not handle what's going on and then there are other leaders who maybe have the right intentions but the way we have become to this election process would need to, you know, go through one of the parties and, and one of the parties may not want them because they're not going to do what's right and good for only that party. Their intention is to do what's right and good for the whole. So how is this person going to have to run as an independent? They're going to have to get the support from so many people in the population. Minds would have to change left and right. So really it's about us. I don't think it's the person that needs to run. I think we'll, when we change, I think the person who can help this country really lead them will start coming forward. Um, and it's, there will be a paved, we will have paved the way for that kind of leadership. So it's really going to still be up to us. I'm hoping you agree, Michael. Um, and so we have Tammy Fox. You are very sensible, insightful, and wise one for sure. Your strength of love is powerful. Thank you for that. I'm working on it every day, and um, and I feel at a deficit every day, to be honest, because I know there's so much more. But I thank you for that because it helps me to keep going, you know. Um, so we have a lot of people who joined in here. I don't know how recently. I see Steve Tolano. I'm so happy that you're doing well. I saw your post. I'm, thank God. I did some prayers for you. Um, we have, um, let's see, Tina Landy says, oh, please, was about Oprah running for president. <laughs> okay. Let's not judge, though, you know, because – Everybody's entitled, and I think it would be really cool that 
is that we um, are so now far out of the box in our thinking that we can actually, and even in, in, in society in general, that a, a woman who is uh, promoting love for decades on television and alternative lifestyle practices and all kinds of ways that we can communicate energetically and spiritually, the idea that they want her to run for president is like, at least that's awesome, right? I mean, imagine if she could put those practices to work in our school districts. And, and I mean, we would just, we would change the world. I mean, don't know if she'd make a good president. I don't even know based on, I don't even know her, her what she would say about anything that's going on in this world or if she'd be good with uh, internationally. I have no idea, really. But I like the idea that we're changing the way we think and that someone who has been promoting love and who's all about that, teaching, learning, and growing, can be looked at as a presidential candidate. I think that's a step forward. Okay. Um, um, okay, so we have, thank you for that, Tina. I understand now. So we have Michael Anthony says, thank you. Lisa Spatola says, 35 years as a hairdresser, I heard everyone drama, LOL. Yeah, I can just imagine. It's definitely something that anyone, especially nurses, you know, I think nurses have it so hard because they're working with people who are actually sick, moaning, and scared. And I wonder if so many nurses are unhealthy because of the what they're bearing every day in energy and all that negativity, what they're taking on. A lot of them don't take care of themselves. A lot of them um, are eating to compensate and will complain to me about uh, being overweight. And I think that's a layer of fat is protection from the negativity. We've been shown this that through the through the centuries that the the people who uh, especially the women who are like the seers, you know, the the wise woman, the medicine woman or whatever over all the different um like the Incas or even American Indian, they were larger women and they felt that was a fat was a protector, you know, um against negative energies. And it makes sense. It's an insulator. Okay, and so perhaps that's why people in those industries struggle so much with their health and their weight because they're really touching. They're they're in it. They're it's nonstop energy. Counselors too, but at least with counselors, you're coming to conclusions. Whereas with a nurse, you're just trying to make the patient feel comfortable. Something nothing sometimes nothing can make them feel comfortable. And a hairdresser is is sitting in a position where they're touching this person. Their whole image is attached to them to the hairdresser, like. You know, and hairdressers, I'm going to have to look in the mirror at myself for, for six, five weeks based on what that hairdresser did to me. So there's such a load in a, uh, to bear. <laughs> for me, it is. I can't imagine um, because my hair means a lot to me, the way I present myself and look. It, that statement really is true. When your hair looks great, you feel great. Um, so imagine then the energy of all these different types of occupations and how it will feel to them with the energy coming out of them all day. It's something to think about, right? Um, okay, so Lisa says, yeah, but it's very hard to let go. The mind said negative, okay, let it go, but the heart wants to hold on. Okay, it's the opposite. The mind is what makes us want to stay negative. The heart is what wants to, it's, we, okay, the soul, let's, let's, let's try to, straighten this out. I'm going to try to see if I can bring in this wisdom on a download so I can say it right, not Donna's opinion, but maybe a better kind of explanation. So if we have an ego and a soul in our in our consciousness, right, we, we're hearing two voices. We have our mind, our human self, which we call the ego. It doesn't mean we're egotistical. It just means that we all have an ego that's dictating part of our inner dialogue. And then we have the soul, which is our essence, which is our energy uh, that we came here to live this life as um, through the body. Okay, And we have what's called the third voice, or we can actually come out of ourselves in both situations to a third kind of party that would we can step outside of ourselves and sort of look in and say, okay, this is what's going on. Which way do you want to go? And so if we really want to stay in that soul voice, but not be humanistically taken advantage of or whatever, we can combine and we can spin that heart and we can love the person unconditionally and still create boundaries or conditions on our relationships. It's okay to do that. 
were allowed to say this person you hurt me and I'm going to leave you now because you know you've done it numerous times and I've given you the benefit of the doubt but I can't see where this is going to work you know, no matter what I do to change I'm not sure if you're willing to change with me and you're allowed to go you're allowed to create those conditions you're allowed to say you know what well you did hurt me I really don't want you to do that to me again can you understand and I mean all this stuff is legitimate um, but you can still love that person unconditionally in the shape that they're in or they, the shape they've gotten themselves into and you can still understand that you're hurt but choose to love more because you want out of the yuck yuck you want out of the negativity you don't want to be stuck in that anger or resentment or anything else in that moment you could actually say to yourself What's my participation in this? Because we bring everything into ourselves. So, okay, someone just hurt me. What's my participation? I'm not laying fault or blame on myself, but I want to know what I did so this doesn't happen again. Let me see truth about what went on here so that I can take the onus off of that person, take responsibility for my part, move forward in my life in a healthful, more profound way, okay, and more strength. And when we do that, we're loving the person by giving them the benefit of the doubt, by accepting that they have a soul and an ego voice, and they happen to just listen to the ego that day, okay? Um, or maybe for a lifetime, who knows? <laughs> um, or maybe for a majority of their day, uh, and that's why we're in this bad state with them, and a relationship could be for 13 years dealing with it. Who knows? So the point is that you're built up resentment, built up anger, but when you do this, when you take the onus off the other person um, by taking responsibility for your part then truth starts to come out and you can realize that it's the two of you together that creates these issues not that you were faulted for his behavior or her or vice versa man woman it's more about your triggers and his triggers coming together and not working and so what do we do we blame the other person for being acting out they blame us for acting out and we never really heal our own issues so instead, you, you realize that you need to come to agreement with yourself, what, what you want to heal from, what triggers that you have, and what way that you are instigating some of the behavior, take responsibility for it, and then say, okay, I want to work on that. And if, and if he doesn't straighten out, and if he doesn't accept his responsibility on his part, it's okay, I get to go. But really what we want to do is we want to show truth because do we, we can't make another person change. We can't make them be who they're not. It's better for us to just step back and look at our own life and see what we need and want and fix our own issues, right? Or come to a more um, balanced state of being and then, and then be able to love the other person unconditionally and say, this is the state of being they're in. I can't force them to be more than that. But if I rise and they want to be with me in that state of being, let's go. And if they don't, it's good that I see where they're at so I can get the hell out of here, okay? Because you want to be in relationships that are symbiotic and and give you the same amount of love back whatever you give out you deserve to get back okay but if it's you that's sitting in a relationship not getting back and if it's you that's addressing your issues rising up loving them more and still seeing an issue then it's you not loving yourself by staying there it's you who's pushing the other person to be better and they're not being better that's a hard to hear but a lot of times because some we, th we, we see someone's soul, we know they can rise up, we want them to rise up, we want to help them rise up, and they're stuck, and they don't want to go, and it's like, by pushing them, even in our mind, we, they're, they, they're holding their ground, they're standing, in the, they're standing in the sand, and they're saying, I'm not moving anywhere, I'm not going to be anything for you. You have to love me the way I am. Now, this is this is a subconscious thing that's going on. That they might be saying it, but most of the time, it's just their energy that's saying it. That they're deciding they're not going anywhere. I'm not being pushed by that person. So when we pull our energy back and just concentrate on ourselves, then we give that person the space to rise up. And if they don't rise up, and we do, we'll feel that imbalance. We'll recognize it. And we'll be okay with leaving. We'll be okay with understanding the way they're right. Maybe not immediately because we're hurt, because we're disappointed, because we love the person, because we want to be with them, because the sex was great, whatever, whatever, whatever. But the point is that when we want to ask for truth of our own part and what we do in our own life, then we get to really see what we're doing to not get what we want or to hurt ourselves, bottom line. And that's important. It's important for all of us to do personal responsibility. It should be taught in school, and it's the number one thing we need. 
in our in our country right now for all of us to do. Tina says Robin Williams is an amazing man. Oh, Patch Adams, Cindy May, thank you, Patch Adams. That was uh, his character, right? And I, th I guess it was the name of the movie. It was such a I love that movie. I watched it's like I don't know how many times. Um, okay, Lisa says Oprah running for president was sarcasm, not to be taken seriously. Oh, okay, <laughs> lol. Um, Dean Lombardo, hi Donna. Sort of jumping on and off tonight. You're awesome as always. Thank you, Dean. You're so sweet, and your energy is always so beautiful, and you're always so complimentary. Ugh, oh, just. How, would it be great if we could all try to build each other up? Wouldn't it be awesome? So um, Gregory Williams says, being a social worker at the VA, I hear it all as well, as well as on a daily basis. Gregory, you are absolutely right to and you, the counselors, therapists, um, so many of them. I don't know. They have to sort of become immune almost in order to protect themselves because if they're empathic, they, they would never be able to live. They wouldn't be able to survive. They would be literally body parts would be falling off of them. I mean. I already lost a large intestines because of it before I understood it. So yeah, you have it, you have it tough to hear all that and to stay, to stay in your zone and to be able to um, maintain your own energy while you're getting, you're dealing with someone else. Michael says, I wonder what would scare a man from a soul like yours. Could he have been too worldly or was he scared? Um, what's a scared man from a soul? Oh, listen, how easy is it if I want to be good? every day and someone else is trying can't how easy would it be to say i can't take this <laughs> like i think about peeing with me like if i was if i was dating me and i'd be like holy crap i don't know because one i can see feel through a lie if someone lies to me i feel it on every level and when you're in a relationship with someone and they're lying, you can't just let it go. If you're a friend with someone and they lie, you can let it go. If it's on Facebook or if it's a, a client or just meeting someone in general and you can feel their lives, all right, let it be. Okay, it doesn't matter. You don't have to call people and everything. But in a relationship, it's scary because that's the man that you're supposed to love and protect, is supposed to love you and protect you, not lie to you. So once I'm scared in a relationship, I act completely different. So I could imagine that an energy flipped, okay, from love to self-protection. Yeah, forget it. I can't even imagine what I'm like to deal with, okay? I'm going to admit it. Um, and so I understand, too, that wanting to be good every day and really striving for that is, is, is huge. It's painful sometimes. It's scary. And it's a lot of work. How many people want to do that? Not a lot of people want to do that. And I will accept responsibility for the type of man I attracted because in the state of being I was in, I attracted what I feared the most, which was men who were capable of lying and, um, and not really true to me. So I was trying to, I guess, soulfully part of me was living out my karma, living out what I needed to heal from in my own self. And I kept on having to meet the same type of man over and over again until I understood, until I gained the self-esteem and awareness, until I healed from the past. So it really isn't about the other men's fault. It's about what I attracted. I attracted men who needed my healing, who needed me as you know more of a mother healer than they did as a girlfriend, even though if they were attracted to me initially, they thought it was love, and then they realized it wasn't. It was um, they needed to be propelled forward maybe in their life and they used me and my energy to do so. And then when they were too much, didn't want to move forward anymore, boom, they're out of there. And um, at least out of there emotionally. They're not really out of there physically because most guys still want the sex, but you can feel when they're not there and that's not a relationship I wanted, so I would leave. Um, and first you try to force them to get that love back. You know, you're like, wait, I'll do anything to be what you wanted to be again. You're almost like inside your self-esteem is saying that. And so you're trying to be who they need you to be. And you realize this, this is not authentic and it sucks and I'm out of here. So um, I think that I say on here all the time, why date? If, if you keep meeting the same kind of person over and over again, don't blame it on the people out there. Instead, just don't pay blame at all on anything and just take responsibility for the state you're in um, and see if you can use your last few relationships to understand yourself, ask for that truth, and then move towards healing whatever issue that was there, whatever triggers that are there, whatever propensity you have to attract someone who's not really right for you, right? So um, let's see. Oh, Anthony's Michael Anthony is bowing off. 
saying thank you, have a good evening, good job. Thank you too, Michael, if you're still there. Um, Tina says, this has been an uplifting time with you. Thank you for sharing the knowledge and wisdom. Well, good, I'm so glad we're, we're ready, ready to leave because it's 8.25. Thank you so much. And Lisa, oh my God, you said you hit it right on the head. Thank you for that answer. I'm so glad we're tuned in. Um, Dean says, I would think it might be harder to deal with ego lead, lead people, especially if you're an empath as you feel their energy. Oh, you're so right. I can so tell. But here's the funniest part. I can tell when I'm an ego versus soul, and that feels worse to me than anything. But when other people are ego versus soul, it sets off my ego. How stupid it should set off my soul instead of my ego. But it almost want you want to go toe to toe, head to head, you kind of thing, instead of bringing in your soul. So there's a potential to go soul to soul. So long story short, you know we all have that ego potential. And um, when I feel it, and I know someone's coming from that place, I have to be more gracious about calling them on it. Be more gracious about the love I have sharing because obviously, if they're in state of ego, they might be threat, feel threatened. They might. Um, need to lie or they might need to do something just to feel better about themselves or self-protect or whatever it doesn't it doesn't matter there's still what's the difference between someone like that and someone that came to me for help it's the same thing in that moment I'm there I'm a part of this process I'm a part of their their life at that even if it's only for 10 minutes or an hour what can I do to leave the best most beautiful loving impression here do I want to leave in a bad way or do I want to leave in a good way? And let me tell you something. I'm saying this to you, but it doesn't mean that I can absolutely do it every minute of the day. I'm working through my stuff too. I'm in it with you guys. You know, I'm telling you about the process because I understand it and I'm teaching it because I understand it. But I'm not telling you that I am the master genius <laughs> like at it, that I can do it every minute and that I'm some spiritual guru that's reached the pinnacle of their spiritual life and loves all the time like the Dalai Lama. No. I don't even know if the Dalai Lama is like the Dalai Lama. It seems like he is, but who knows? I don't spend every minute of the day with him. Okay. So, and I don't mean to put down the Dalai Lama. Please don't, don't say that. Don't think, don't, don't repeat that like in a bad way. I don't mean it that way. Just the Dalai Lama might have his challenges too. He's just not telling us about them. Okay. Larry says, true. If they lie once, you'll always wonder if they're lying again. Absolutely. Um, so, so many people um, are, are on here and, I, I could go on for another hour, but it's 8.30. I've been on here for an hour and a half. I love you guys. It's been one heck of a evening. I hope I didn't alienate anyone. Um, and, yeah, you're probably going to think differently about it now because I can cry on air, but whatever. I am really trying my best to help our country, mostly our kids. And I hope that there's more people out there like me who want to do the same. That's what all this is about, okay? So have a great night, everyone. I love you all. And please email me at Donna at DonnaMartini.com if you need more information or inbox me if you need my help. Or if you just want to give a comment or maybe you want to help me. That would be awesome. All right. Good night.